Hello and welcome to this special bonus episode of The Dairy Edge. Chagas are running a weekly Let's Talk Dairy webinar series, which is also being made available as a podcast. On this week's webinar, Stuart Childs discusses various topics, including tips on managing the last weeks of the breeding season to ensure all cows you want to keep are bred and management of silage pits. A few timely reminders, I suppose, to be honest. Uh, I think um, silage is caught. Um, we're beginning to come to the end of the breeding season, which I'm going to talk about as well. Um, but we also need to, um, I suppose, maybe start re- assess- assessing what's gone, um, gone, gone on during the course of the year and uh, maybe plan for the rest of the year and plan for future years around what we need to do. So uh, I won't be long today, it's 10, 15 minutes probably at most. Um, you, some of you may or may not find this uh, relevant. I think it's probably relevant to all, but it's, and it's just, as I said, a timely reminder maybe to uh, the people to um, start uh, thinking about what's gone on so far this year and what they need to do for the rest of the year maybe. Yeah. So I suppose just first thing, first I suppose we're just beginning to um, make our way into the latter half of the breeding season, depending on the date that you started. You're going to have a varying finishing time. And as you will well know, we'll be advocating that people would have uh, a tight breeding season in order to have a tight calving season and that we can get this kind of um, systematic approach to the true farming in a grass-based system so that we calve on time, breed on time, can dry off in, in on mass basically if you want to. And then obviously we're ready for the following calving season again. So depending on the start date, depending on where you are in the country, uh, that time is coming at you fairly sharpishly, or else it's a bit further away. Maybe you're not as far into the breeding season as others are. So obviously you can see there we we range from probably the 15th to the 20th of April, in some cases even the 1st of April, um, breeding start dates, which means that those people will be finishing uh, very, very shortly. For those of you that started around the 20th of April, you're looking at the 13th of July being your finish date on a 12 week breeding season the more common i suppose is the 25th 27th of april start date so that's the 18th of july or the 20th of july uh, for to finish up um with the may at the people who start in may um and in or around may 7th may 1st ranging from the 24th of july through to the 30th of july now we spoke about this i suppose uh, on a number of occasions and george would have spoken about it last year as well in relation to pulling the bull early uh, obviously, if you've been in a scenario where you've been calving um, off of a 15-week breeding season, then there are cows in the herd that aren't going to be probably falling into line to finish up on a 12-week breeding season. So if you are making the decision to cut back, you have to be conscious that there's possibly a cost associated with that in terms of loss of animals if you're going to go for the big bang and take them out after three or just remove stop breeding after 12 weeks in one go. Uh, or the alternative is that you creep back bit by bit and, and we've talked about it there a couple of weeks ago as well. So I suppose the before, like this is just to highlight that um, today is the 17th of June and obviously the, there's only kind of four weeks left for those early um, starters, we'll say there was April herds. Um, so the most important thing then is to make sure that we have everything that we want to keep on the farm bread. So if, if as I said, you're going, coming off of a 15 week breeding season, you may not, your cows may, not, may just about be kind of coming right to actually be bred if they're all calved at this stage. Uh, so we need to follow up on those and make sure that they do get bred. And th- without a doubt, there's a level of fatigue comes into, into farming at this stage of the year because we've had been going full tilt basically since uh, maybe late January, early February with calving. Again, it's been, I suppose, a difficult season or difficult year in one sense in that uh, we've been under pressure for grass for quite a period. And then when things turned around, we were under pressure to manage the grass. So it's been a little bit unrelenting and maybe in in one sense, so people are tired uh, and the the mind can be come off the game a small little bit. So we just need to refocus for one last uh, shot at the the breathing situation. So just refer you back to what Dan O'Riordan spoke to us about from ICBF a couple of weeks ago in terms of running the weekly fertility report identifying any cows that haven't yet been bred and putting a plan in place with your vet in order to make sure that they get um, a straw put into them or get served. Um, leaving it to chance may work, but it may not as well. So I think probably being proactive about it, if you want to keep these animals in the herd, uh, you should be moving on these fairly quickly now. So 
run the weekly fertility report as Dan showed us a couple of weeks ago um, try and get those cows bred as quickly as possible the earlier the better obviously if you're in the April 20th scenario and you have four weeks left if you can get them bred in the next week or so there's a possibility that they can get two, two if they repeat that they'll get two serves and uh, obviously as we go on a little bit more there's greater opportunity there so the, the extra weeks will, will count for people but just to keep the foot on the pedal in terms of breeding follow through to make sure that the, the all the cows are bred that you want to keep and um, maximise the chances of retaining those because obviously they're, they're not by the nature of the, the bovine reproductive cycle there's going to be a proportion of them repeat anyway so we need to get them bred sooner rather than later to give them the chance of getting a second uh, serve if, if necessary okay so that's the breeding piece, I suppose, as I said. Uh, it's just to try and keep the foot on the pedal for now. The next piece I'm going to talk about is a kind of regulatory stuff again that we have to keep on top of or that we have to be mindful of. So silage pits, I suppose, there's a two elements to this. There's the management of the pit itself. I suppose you just need to check effluent flows from silage pits now. Depending on when you've it done, there's an awful lot of, I was in West Cork yesterday, a lot of silage cut over the previous week. Uh, weekend actually because I was had been down there last week as well and they, they were very much behind as Michal O'Leary may have alluded to last week uh, things were rather tricky in West Cork in terms of weather with the last number of weeks so a lot of silage gone in now in the last number in the last week or two and then I suppose over the country uh, all the silage has literally been done since the first of June really nearly um, so just check effluent flows from pits make sure that they're diverted obviously just in case somebody hasn't been diverted and take uh, action if there has something has to be done in terms of effluent getting away from a pit um, make sure a reception tanks of adequate capacity would be a very important thing as well and um, we've seen situations in the past where the effluent was diverted but the tank was actually full already with, with slurry so the capacity of the tank was obviously limited in terms of what it could take for, for effluent and it backed up the, um, the pipe and actually overflowed from the, the, the diversion point into a stream so causing a problem in one case then I suppose just from a management point of view, it's important, I suppose, the, the, the beauty of bales is that uh, once they're wrapped, they're wrapped generally, and as long as they're not damaged, you have a good effective seal. Silage pits have to be managed in that, uh, obviously, they sink after a couple of days or even within a day or two of being filled, and you need to tighten the cover, and quite often we can go in, I, I, I see it myself, that you drive into a yard and you see a cover kind of flapping or quite loose area as a as a one of the our clients described it before so we need to make sure that that's tightened up to make sure that there's an effective seal to to get the ensiling process to occur then i suppose um definitely a lot of what i've heard a lot of in the last couple of weeks is that the first cuts have been massive uh, very big yields from them quality wise we, i suppose we'll have to wait and see what way they're going to work out just but they did fill out very quickly in a very short space of time and all contractors have found that they have had bigger um, first cuts than would have been expected given the way the weather had been. So planning for that second cut, I know in, in, a, in one case, large herd that has obviously multiple pits, they've gone into a second cut pit um, with their first cut in terms of capacity that uh, they ran out of space and what they would have expected to put their first cut into. Uh, so does that mean that you're going to be under pressure if you're putting in a second cut into that area as well? and maybe you need to make a plan for that. Uh, possibly may have to be held some second cut in order to allow for safe storage of silage, okay? So just be, be conscious of that. So there is a fodder budgeting uh, tool on PBI that uh, I think we've shown to you in the past. Um, so it's probably worth a look at there just to plan winter feed re requirements and see what you have in, in stock following your first cut um, and then planning of second cut areas. Maybe there might be opportunities to recede if you have a lot of silage in stock. If, if you're fortunate enough to have silage left over from um, the previous winter and you now have a very big first cut gone in as well, there may be opportunities to take out some uh, ground and not necessarily put it in for a second cut. But be very sure that you have a good reserve built into your fodder budget in that scenario. Um, it's important that we always carry a reserve if we can at all to allow for situations like we probably experienced in the spring of this year where we were slightly tight. Uh, one thing being to our advantage was that we were still able to get out and graze because uh, conditions were good but it was just cold and there was poor growth um, but if we were in a scenario where that was a wet spring along with uh, poor growth we would have had to feed a lot more silage and in some cases some people are actually out of silage obviously after the, after the spring that we had 
so they will have to replenish that. So be very sure that you have a good buffer, kind of a good reserve in there in terms of um, if you do hit a bump in the road or if you ended up getting lapped up or anything and had extra stock on hand, that you would have uh, adequate silage available to you. So don't cut it too tight, but I'm also saying that there may be opportunities to receive some of the silage ground early, obviously, which is to its benefit and to get it established well before uh, the end of the year. Um, but also maybe that you might be able to free up ground on a milking platform if you take silage off the milking platform to receive that instead of taking a second cut from it or maybe take a lighter or first cut from it that you could take quality silage from. The other question then I suppose uh, it's cropping up a lot in the last couple of weeks given the size of the first cut crops that have been there is will there be extra feed storage space needed for the future? Um, so there's a health and safety concern being raised quite significantly around the heights of pits that uh, contractors are being asked to put in. And so as we've, I think we've discussed it before maybe as well about the increase in the, the numbers on fair, of stock on farms, but in general there probably hasn't been an increase in the feed storage capacity on the farm to match that. And look, I suppose that's understandable. Obviously people try to put the stock there obviously to pay for facilities in due course and try to manage with what they have as best as they can. But at the same time, we can't uh, overlook health and safety issues around um, people working on the farm, obviously. And if we're, being, if we're asking contractors to go to a dangerous height with silage pits, uh, then we need to start looking at options around increasing that feed capacity, or else you're going to have to look at bailing a uh, proportion of your crop to reduce the height of that pit for those contractors. So I think, look, long term, obviously, the more storage capacity that people have and the more storage space people have, it's going to be a better thing. So planning that, uh, just assessing it now, obviously not say, suggesting that you're going to have to do, you're doing it straight away, but you need to look at the situation and, and, and um, ask yourself the question, do you need to be looking at putting down another silage slab or extending the slab that you have or something along those lines, just in order to improve the health and safety of the farmyard. And look, it's not different from your own point of view, if the contractor is concerned about going to the height that he's going to, uh, if you're ultimately removing tires or removing plastic from that pit and it's a very high pit, you're obviously in, in danger yourself and we want to try and eliminate those risks as much as possible. So um, plenty of space obviously will make it a lot easier for, for everybody concerned. So then I suppose this is something that everybody that's a Chagas client will have gotten in the, um, the newsletter that was sent out for June. And it relates to derogation, I suppose, in particular. But I would say that people should be thinking along the lines of if you're not in derogation, that many of these rules and regulations are only a matter of uh, years, a very few short years, even for that matter, away from being applied to, um, to, to all farms, probably, or definitely farms that are farming at any level of intensity and not even derogation and intensity. So just, um, I suppose, it's, it, this is supposed to come into play. It, it did come into force from the 1st of January of this year, and we've had plenty of warning about it, I suppose, in that it was flagged two years ago that it was going to come into play on the 1st of January 2021. But we were very, uh, it, was, it was quite slow in terms of getting the information as to what was actually going to be required in terms of how it was going to be uh, implemented, etc. So just to run down through these again, excluding um, animals from water courses. So you can see here in this scenario that the cows are actually going into the water with the gates set up here in order to allow them access to the stream for drinking. And obviously you can see here just behind, if you can see the mouse moving there, and that there's obviously the traffic and going in and out of the river is creating a muddy area there or a soiled area there basically, which means that in heavy rain that there's going to be runoff and sediment is going to be moved into that water. Um, also, the cows and, and the stock moving in and out of the water are going to bring sediment into that water as well, as well as likely donging in the water as well. So there's an E. coli slash water quality issue from that point of view. The other issue that comes about from that scenario then is that phosphorus binds the soil particles and when they get brought into the water course there, it's actually bringing phosphorus into the water as well. So you can see the objective here will be to remove the, the, the stock from the river completely and fence the boundary out then at 1.5 metres from the top of the bank as well. Uh, and the same applies then to the water troughs, as you know, no matter what way. And I think these plastic troughs are particularly bad for it, but uh, they can tend to form a little island because the stock are coming in, they're lapping water that's spilling out around it. You don't generally tend to have hardcore areas around these that are able to take the traffic then coming to them 
and they can have quite a lot of um, muck and mud around them and they're there right beside the water course. So obviously the risk is that the, the, the sediment goes into the water course here again. And as I said already, that the pea attached to that sediment then is now in the water course as a result of it. So uh, some people have this done already, but it's just, a t as I said, a timely reminder that six months has gone since, or, or maybe slightly less has gone since you were talking, if you're in derogation, since you're talking to your advisor in relation to this. Uh, and it's just to remind you that this is a requirement of your derogation. So you need to be uh, going about this now as things are calming down slightly from the, the very busy first period of the year that's associated with dairy farming in general. So you can see the objective would be to move them 20 meters from water courses. I suppose Tom Ryan and uh, Francis Quigley and those have always advocated that we would move uh, water troughs to the middle of the, the fields to give greater options or greater access to them during the course of the grazing season. Those throw its own complications in, I suppose, in mixing break or when grazing breaks in the springtime, but uh, they're the idea would be that they should be in the center of the paddock generally. So you need to move them away from the water course anyway and a very minimum 20 meters from them. Now uh, this was a big concern, the, the third one here was a big concern for people where cows are crossing rivers on a regular basis or water courses on a regular basis and if they're fenced on both sides um, and the cows are only crossing uh, then it's actually okay. Obviously this is much preferred option to bridge it um, from the point of view that you obviously remove the cows from the river. Again, the same thing applies here. Look, with the best will in the world, there's going to be sediment uh, on the cows feet as they're going through this. The other thing is obviously the cows are going to dung, especially when they do step into water, they tend to, to uh, lift the tail. So a bridge, bridge scenario, I think if you're using it on a very regular basis, we should be looking at uh, putting in bridges. Uh, water quality is something that we're going to be judged on very strongly over the next number of years, obviously, and we need to have quick wins as quick as possible. These don't have to be massively expensive. I think uh, the other thing is if there are options to move machinery around by roadways rather than across these bridges, these bridges don't have to be uh, super, super structures um, like anything that you'd need to carry heavy, heavy weight. Um, maybe no harm just to have them capable of carrying a tractor and fertilizer spreader possibly. But uh, in terms of silage equipment, if you have road access to fields if, or slurry equipment, you could send them around the road rather than having to put them across the bridge and that will obviously reduce the, the kind of the loading capacity or the capacity of that bridge to carry weight apart from uh, cows crossing it so that can help to reduce the cost associated with something like that. Finally then I suppose farm roadways. Some farms in the country don't have to worry about this at all because they don't have dikes and drains running along by roadways but then there's a lot of farms obviously that are on different diff more difficult soils that are depending on drains and dikes to improve uh, um, soil quality, etc. So you can see here in this scenario, we have no fence along by the, the river here. Um, the track is here, obviously, and we need to fence that in order to make sure that no stock gets into it. It is fenced along at this side, whereas in this scenario, we can see that the fence line is in place along by the dike here, and the road is falling actually across this way as well, back into the paddock as well. So that's the other thing, I suppose, in relation to uh, what people have to do at the moment, is that uh, where roadways are falling in towards dikes, they're going to have to be recambered to move the, the potential flow, which can be anything from eight litres up to anything around the eight litre mark of dung and urine coming from cows on a daily basis on roadways. And obviously the fact that they're hard surfaces when rain falls on them, it, if the fall is into the dike, then it's going to convey the nutrient associated with that dung and urine directly to the dike. So we need to follow those away into the, into the field here and the field will act, actually act as a kind of a nutrient trap then. So we maybe need to be a bit more uh, organized around what we need to do in these uh, because mo most people will probably have to do some sort of recambering or correction of the direction of flow, um, whereas maybe not all people will have to do fencing. So finally, I suppose um, the last piece then is just to assess the situation around soil water um, and the creation of soil water. So what you're talking about when you come to soil water is pretty much collecting yards, uh, feeding yards where stock are out in the open and they're being fed. Uh, that water obviously has to be collected. And that's a significant volume. I mean, we talk about slurry storage in a lot of cases. Uh, slurry storage probably on a lot of farms can be adequate. Um, until we add the soil water fraction into it. And then we have vast quantities of water being collected um, that 
are contributing to very high levels of slurry slash soil water, which is now defined as slurry, um, in slurry tanks and putting pressure on the storage capacity on the farm and forcing people to try and drop levels of tanks um, in inappropriate weather. So I suppose I, I think uh, a lot of people maybe focus on storage capacity. I think we maybe it, it's no harm to actually focus on can we minimize the volumes that are being pushed into these tanks or being collected by these tanks. And that can in itself can create um, extra capacity as was within farms. So I think it's no harm to look at these options around soil yards would obviously be to cover them. Um, the other options that are there is to make sure that in the, the during the winter period that we're not forced to collect them if they're not in use. So a collecting yard that is um, not, not in use once the cows are dried off, that it can be cleaned down, washed down properly, collected into the slurry tank and then diverted any washing water coming off that and then be diverted to a clean water outfall. The other thing that we would generally find, and again, it's a complacency issue uh, on farms because you just get used to things, is that down pipes along the likes of these sheds and yards tend to, uh, if they get broken, don't tend to get fixed in a timely fashion. So I think, look, this is a good time of year to be looking at those situations. Um, a tractor turns around dropping a bale of silage or something, clips a, a, a chute, next thing that chute is running down into the, into the yard. And as you know, with, with some of the heavy outbursts of rain that we get from time to time, uh, it, do, it could be a very short space of time to filling a tank and then people come under pressure, they have to relieve the pressure obviously by putting out slurry and we need to try to move away from that. So there's a two-pronged approach to this, there's the management of the soil water areas, uh, dairy washings, can we reduce them in some way, can they be reused maybe to wash down yards and stuff to minimise what has to be collected and we just minimise what has what washing needs to be done in any kind of a way at all and uh, to reduce soil water storage requirements and then also just making sure that we're not uh, collecting clean water that we don't need to be cleaning. So it now is a good time to examine the yard in that sense and see can we put some um, corrective measures in place, I suppose, in, in between. And as I said, it doesn't necessarily mean that we need to build. Uh, in, in some cases, it can, like there's significant soil water collection in some cases, and maybe we can manage that better to minimize the requirement to actually collect that during the close period. Um, but it, look, it, there's no doubt about it, there are people that are going to have to look at installing uh, storage facilities as well. And if anything, look, I'm only speculating when I say this, but if anything, storage requirement periods are probably likely to increase, if anything. Um, so any kind of additional storage facilities that you're putting in place now are going to be actually an advantage to you into the future, as well as just being a real source of uh, stress relief, I suppose, if in the on the occasion that we have bad weather when we come into into that January period when slurry can be spread, that we're not forced to spread slurry, that we're more comfortable. That works for everybody, works for you as a farmer, would work for a contractor not being under savage pressure to be expected to push out slurry out of every farm in the country in the one day, basically. Um, and then just purely from, obviously, from the big win is from the, in the environment's point of view, if we can hold our slurry until such time as we can make best use of it, the risk of overland flow, etc., is is reduced quite significantly. So we're spreading in appropriate conditions, I suppose. Time of the year there now is going to vary from county to county, from parish to parish, even. Um, so like some people will be quite safe spreading slurry in, immediately after the close period in the right conditions. Other people are obviously going to have to carry it for longer, even though you might be in a zone that's only 16 weeks, your land type may not be suitable to it. So we need to be looking now at this stage of the year to see what can we do uh, to eliminate these areas uh, from soil water. Obviously, the simple things would be to fix the likes of the down pipes, as I said, that are broken, that are running onto these. And as I said, it's complacency. And that's not a negative when I say that. It's just we get used to seeing something wrong. It's maybe not a big problem at the moment. We forget about it very quickly. It's, it's just a habituation, I suppose, I think to describe it as that, that we get used to seeing that scenario and we don't fix it. So maybe go around the yard in the next couple of weeks, uh, assess the situation in terms of downpipes and where is their soil water being generated from? Can you do something about it? Write it up somewhere so that you have a list uh, that you can refer back to so that you don't have to go around doing the assessment again. 
and then put a plan in place to try and, as I said, reduce the soil water generation if you can, or if you can't, maybe start thinking along the lines of increasing the storage capacity. Now, uh, I suppose it is, there is some talk of uh, increased soil, soil water storage capacity requirements coming on, on stream as well. So it may be no harm to do this anyway, to be reducing your soil water requirements, which may also be looking at having to increase soil water capacity as well. And that could be as simple as a large storage tank that you're maybe filling with a, a submersible pump that won't necessarily cost the earth. It doesn't have to be a big concrete store or anything. But uh, look, so, so slurry capacity in general, I suppose, is something that we need to be looking at and, and assessing. And now is a good time of the year to be doing that, as, as I said, the pressure is beginning to come off. So I suppose that's pretty much it for today. As I said, I just wanted to say a few timely reminders, I suppose, that people are beginning to get a little bit more relaxed at this stage. With silage first got done, generally uh, things begin to start to calm down a small bit on farm. Um, so the opportunity is there now to maybe look into these aspects of the farm. Uh, so I suppose the, the two things that we need to focus on, I suppose, is making sure that we get cows bred that haven't been bred so far. Look at your finish of your breeding season. Can you uh, shorten it up? Um, and what you need to do, obviously, as I said, is to make sure that you've all the cows bred before you make that decision, I suppose. So you need to, you need to make sure that every cow is bred uh, before you go pulling um, your bull or whatever from or stop your AI season if you're cutting back to make sure that you're not going to have significant empty cow losses as a result of a significant change in your breeding season or else you just start to work back gradually and then on this aspect of it here in terms of the silage effluent and the silage yards and soil water collection and so forth from dirty yards can you do a consult with your advisor look at the farmyard, can you do something to reduce it? Do you need to increase the silage storage capacity, as I said, uh, effluent storage capacity, et cetera, and uh, just put a plan in place then to deal with that, so that uh, you're obviously avoiding creating any pollution issues. And the other aspect of it is, I suppose, maybe reducing stock numbers coming into the winter is something that people could use to uh, reduce capacity requirements as well. So everything should be on the table. I'm not saying that anyone has to reduce their herd size in order to keep in line with their slurry storage. If you want to add the slurry storage, that's fine. In some cases, people have decided to cut back because maybe they don't have a successor and they don't see the justification for building extra capacity for uh, when there's no one coming through to follow on from them. But uh, slurry storage capacity is something that's going to become more and more in the limelight than ever before, I suppose. So it's worthwhile having a look at that. So. Look, I suppose just some topics that we're going to cover in the next couple of weeks, I suppose, is actually around that uh, pulling the bull. Again, we'll have a, a refresher on that, just the advantages of doing it, I suppose. I'm going to look at some protected urea issues around the spreader with Francis Quigley there in the next couple of weeks as well. And uh, there's, uh, um, there's other issues as well with ICBF that Dan Reardon is looking to, to talk to you about to just make you aware of as well. So there are some of the topics that are coming up. We'll wrap it up at that for today anyway, and sure we'll talk to you again next week. Uh, enjoy the fine weather while we have it, and uh, everybody stay safe and take care, uh, both from a health and safety point of view of farming and from a COVID point of view, and we'll talk to you next week. Thanks very much. That's all for this week's Let's Talk Dairy webinar series, and don't forget to look out for more bonus episodes each week. I'll be back with our usual Dairy Edge interview on Monday, so do listen in then. I'm Emma-Louise Coffey, and thanks for listening.